Well, g'day everyone. Here it is, our caravan buying guide, taking you from overwhelm to finding the right caravan for you. We know it can be an overwhelming process. We've been through it twice now, and we've learned a lot through that. So we're gonna take you through our three phases of buying a new caravan to go from overwhelm and starting the whole process right through to your final specifications. And we're gonna tell you a few tips and tricks that are gonna save you thousands of dollars in the process. So stick around for that. Thanks so much for watching the ads, guys. As you know, 10% of all our YouTube revenue goes towards a charity. This month is going to the Royal Flying Doctor, so it's a very good cause. We do appreciate your help with that. It supports the charities and it also supports our content. If you find this content useful and helpful and you like it, you think it's a bit of all right, hit that subscribe button. It is 100% free. And if you also hit the bell, you'll get a notification when we've got a next video out. All right, guys, enough of that. Let's dive into it and find you the perfect caravan for you and save you some money in the meantime. Let's do it. Phase one is all about narrowing down the search. There's hundreds of caravan manufacturers in Australia. So phase one, we're gonna be going through our top 10 ways to narrow that search from hundreds of manufacturers to a handful so that you can start your research process. All right, so step one is obviously determining your budget. There is everything on the market from an entry level pod Jayco that you can get for $25,000 all the way up to a top spec level brooder that's gonna cost you over 300,000 and literally everything in between. So first thing is you're gonna do is set your budget and look at where your budget sits in that range. Now you've figured out your budget, number two is weight and not, no, not your weight, the weight of the caravan that you can tow with your tow vehicle. If you already own a tow vehicle, make sure you do your sums and figure out what you can tow. The biggest one here, the biggest mistake we see people making is that they assume that because their car is rated to tow three tonne, three and a half tonne, four tonne, whatever it might be, that they can tow that much. That's not the case. Go and do your homework, look into GVM, GCM, axle load ratings, all of that before you start shopping for a caravan so you don't fall in love with something that you can't actually tow. If you haven't got your tow vehicle yet and you're in the market, try and do that shopping together. Look at what you can want to, might want to buy and what you can tow it with all at the same time and bring that all into your budget if possible. That's the ideal scenario. Have a look as well at what upgrades may be available for your particular vehicle. Post-registration and pre-registration are different and each state is different when it comes to post-registration upgrades that might help you to tow. But keep in mind that a GVM upgrade doesn't necessarily mean you can tow more, it just means that the car can carry more. There's a few pitfalls there and it's really worth diving in and doing your research on weights before you get too far into the caravan purchasing process. At the end of the day, it's a hell of a lot cheaper to make mistakes on paper when you're doing your calculations than it is after you've already committed and laid down your hard earned. The next thing you're gonna work out is how frequently are you gonna be using this caravan? Is it for weekends? Is it for a few weeks at a time? A few months at a time? Living in it full time or a hot lap? These things are gonna help you determine how much internal space you're gonna want and how much storage you're gonna to need to do the things that you wanna do with it. If you're only using it for weekends, you might not need all the bells and whistles. However, if you're living it in it full time or doing a hot lap, you might want a few of those extra creature comforts. This is gonna help you narrow down what size and style of caravan is gonna suit you. More on the style later. The next thing to think about is where you're gonna go with the caravan. That's gonna help you decide whether an on-road, a semi-off-road or an off-road caravan is more suitable to your needs. Now, an on-road caravan is generally gonna be a bit cheaper and a bit lighter. Uh, the downside is obviously it's gonna be a bit more limited as to where it can go. And in general as well, they're less equipped uh, for off-grid, extended periods at least, of off-grid stays. Moving on to the semi-off-road. This is a term in the caravan industry that we don't 100% agree with. Uh, we can see what the people are trying to say by semi-off-road, but in our opinion, it can either do it or it can't uh, as far as going off-road is concerned. But generally with a semi-off-road, you can have a little bit more off-road capability. You're gonna be able to go a little bit further than you would with your on-road caravan. It's a bit of a compromise with weight and cost as well. It's generally gonna be cheaper than an off-road van, but a little bit more than your on-road van and a little bit heavier as well. And it's generally gonna come with a little bit more in the way of off-grid capability. Moving then on to your off-road caravans, which 
for us is our preference. Uh, that's going to be your full off-road caravan that can go anywhere in Australia and do it all. It's not about necessarily doing low range rock crawling type tracks. It's more about can it do hundreds of kilometres at a time of pounding corrugations because that's a caravan killer. That's what's going to destroy any caravans that aren't up to scratch. So for us, our preference is to go to a dedicated off-road caravan builder if you decide you want an off-road caravan. The advantage being that that entire caravan from the ground up has been engineered as an off-road caravan. Conversely, a lot of the ca off-road caravans that are an up-spec version of an on-road or a semi-off-road caravan have just had a few tweaks made. They've probably got a suspension uh, upgrade from the uh, lower spec model they might have a little bit more clearance and a little bit more capability as far as off-grid is concerned but they haven't approached the build from the ground up in general as an off-road caravan like a specialist off-road caravan a builder would now which one for you is going to depend on where you want to go on your trip and how much you're going to be disappointed by not being able to get into certain places whether you've got the tow limits to be able to tow a bigger or an off-road caravan and whether you've got the budget for it as well so to help you narrow down the search, the next thing you're going to want to do is work out your absolute no compromise items. What is an absolute deal breaker if the caravan doesn't have it? There is no perfect caravan out there, so you're going to have to at some point make compromises with other things, but make a list of your absolute no compromise items. So an example of some of our personal non-compromise items, and remember yours will be different to ours, but ours were off-road capable extended off-grid stays with a decent battery system that would allow us to indefinitely camp off-grid. It's been eight months since we plugged into a PowerPoint, so we've nailed that one. Um, we needed a composting toilet that would allow us to do those sorts of things. We wanted an internal bathroom and a gasless caravan. Now to continue to narrow down your search, part of your research should involve uh, getting online and doing a lot of research there. Fact of the matter is these days online is a great place to get a lot of good information. There's obviously printed articles and forums and things like that. Facebook groups can be a really good resource, but just keep in mind uh, that there's going to be a lot of recommendations from a whole lot of manufacturers depending on what people have bought. Generally, people recommend the caravan that they bought because, like us, they're going to love the caravan they bought and that's why they bought it. Uh, other places you can go for information are going to be places like this, YouTube. There's a lot of great YouTube videos out there from a whole range of sources. Like anyone though, we're going to have some bias. Every YouTube video you're going to watch is going to have some bias. Uh, and whether that's just personal bias or other biases, things like uh, magazine articles or online articles, uh, you've got to be aware that there's going to be some bias there as well. But take all that information in as part of your research process. Just be in mind too that it's particularly in those Facebook groups that often it's more of the problems get aired than, and they always get more airtime than the positive ones. But yeah, take it, take it into consideration as you're doing your research. It can be a really good way to find out some good information about different caravans that you may not be aware of and different manufacturers you may not be aware of. Getting into one of the Facebook owners groups for that manufacturer is a great place to look for information on what kind of issues that manufacturer might be having, are they major problems, are they minor problems, has the customer been able to contact the manufacturer, are there issues being dealt with, um, things like that are really what you want to be looking for. Keeping in mind that those Facebook groups are always going to get, the problems are always going to get more airtime than the good things because that's really what they're there for. They're there for people to show where they've been but also what problems they've had um, to troubleshoot. So just have a look in the Facebook groups if you can get access to them. Not every manufacturer will let you but how, how, what kind of issues are coming? Are they major? Are they minor? And are people happy with the customer service level that they're getting? Something else to be aware of when you're doing your research is white label caravans. What's a white label caravan? It's basically a caravan brand that isn't a manufacturer. There's quite a lot of these in the caravan industry where you might see a brand on a caravan but the van's actually built by a different manufacturer. It's not necessarily a bad thing, it's just something to be aware of. For us, we feel like there's an opportunity there for problems to occur when it comes to warranty and things like that and particularly potential for a bit of a blame game to go in. It's just an extra person in the process that doesn't necessarily need to be there. Uh, but if you do fall in love with a white label caravan, there's nothing inherently wrong with them. You just need to be aware of it. It's something that we weren't aware of when we first started sh caravan shopping. If you're not sure, obviously one way is to ask them ask the brand where the caravan's built. Uh, another way is to check the compliance plate that all caravans have to have when they're sold in Australia. And that will tell you who makes that caravan. 
Next thing you want to look at is resale value. So looking at the resale value of, your manu of the manufacturers that you're looking at is going to give you an indication of the total cost of ownership of that van. So what do I mean by that? For example, let's just round numbers. If the van costs $200,000 but will sell in a year's time for $170,000, that's going to give you a total cost of $30,000 of ownership. Why is that important? Well, it gives you, it lets you compare the total cost, which could save you money. It might be worth spending more to get a brand that has a better resale value. In the same way that you look at cars, there's a reason that secondhand Toyotas hold their value because they're a reputable brand and people trust that company. If people are selling a secondhand caravan at a higher rate than other brands, it's going to give you an indication of the quality and, the, and how sought after those vans are. Can you do a factory tour? This is a really, really big one, and it's about a lot more than just having a look around the factory and seeing the way the caravans are built, although that can be a really insightful process, and probably one that you're gonna do later in your research process once you've got a short list there. Now, you'll find that some manufacturers won't offer a factory tour. Some may be because they're a white label manufacturer, but there's a whole other um, side of it where people just don't offer factory tours. We think that's potentially a bit of a warning sign. Um, in our opinion, if you've got nothing to hide, let people go through your factory. We've heard a whole lot of excuses as to why people won't do factory tours, but at the end of the day, I think if the manufacturer is proud of what they do and want you to see how well they build their caravans, that's a really good sign that they're gonna back their product uh, and then what they're doing is of the highest quality and that they've got nothing to hide. Now the next one's probably going to go without saying, but it's something worth checking, is what is that manufacturer's lead time? If you have a deadline where you are off on your trip and you need a caravan before then, just make sure you can get it in time. You've been through that phase of narrowing down your caravan search. Hopefully by now you've got yourself a pretty decent shortlist. Phase two, we're going to get into the guts of it. And first up is construction types. One thing you'll come across when you start to research caravans is there's a variety of different ways to build a caravan. The first is timber frame. Timber frame is either a stick frame or a plywood frame with an internal and exterior lining and your services are run through that cavity in the wall and then it's insulated, etc. Advantages to timber is it's quite cheap to build. Uh, downsides are it can be a little bit heavier and the other downside is that if you do get water into those walls, if you have a leak or something like that, then it can be quite a significant issue. The next main caravan construction type you're going to come across is aluminium frame like our latest caravan. That can either be a welded frame or a riveted frame. Uh, advantages to aluminium frame, it's obviously timber free so if you do get any leaks you're not going to have those water ingress issues. It tends to be a bit lighter and it's incredibly strong for for its weight. It is generally going to be a little bit more expensive though than a timber frame. The third main construction type you're going to come across is composite panel uh, caravans, not to be confused with composite clad caravans with aluminium cladding. This composite panel is a foam sandwich panel, fiberglass skin on either side with a foam core in the middle. Advantages are it's very, very strong, it's quite light and it is also very well insulated. Downsides are again it's going to be another step up in the price bracket. They're generally more expensive composite caravans and also services and things uh, like your plumbing and electrical have to be run internally which we've seen done well and done not so well so something to keep an eye out for there. We've never owned a timber frame caravan but we've owned now a composite panel and an aluminium uh, frame caravan. Ours is a riveted aluminium frame. I'd buy either of those construction types again. I think they've both got their strengths and weaknesses. Uh, I think they're both extremely good. We've had no serious issues with either of them. Next up chassis. This is probably one of the questions we get asked the most is should I get a painted chassis, should I go for a powder coated chassis or should I get a hot dip gal chassis. Like everything, pros and cons to all of them. Paint, we've had both now a painted chassis and a galvanized chassis. Downside to gal is that it's going to be heavier. It can add anywhere between 30 to 80 kilos to your caravan depending on the size of caravan and it's a little bit inconsistent. Until it's dipped you don't always know exactly how much weight it's going to add but it does give you the maximum corrosion protection. This one that we've got now is a painted chassis. It's a still a Duragal steel underneath, so it still has some corrosion protection, but the paint obviously is much lighter than gal. Downsides are it can be scratched and damaged. Mind you, you can touch it up relatively easily, but you do get that significant weight saving. 
The third type is powder coating. Uh, we will probably look at this for our next caravan potentially, but I think powder coating is not a bad compromise or a balance between the two. Really good, uh, obviously, corrosion protection, a little bit tougher than paint. Uh, downside being it will be a bit more difficult to touch up. If you can afford the weight, I really think Gal is a really good way to go. Uh, just be aware that it can stain, especially when you get over to WA uh, and get into the red dirt. So you need to be uh, pretty diligent with washing it. But yeah, I think overall, if you can afford the weight, Gal is the way to go. Now it's time for suspension. You've got the body, you've got the chassis. What suspension are we putting under it? Partly this decision is going to be decided by what you decided earlier on, whether you're going on-road, semi, off-road or off-road, but there are still a few options out there. Most caravans these days are going a trailing arm suspension. So each wheel and tyre is supported by its own suspension arm with its own shock absorber and its own spring. But you do have some options around brakes and around what type of springs there are. For us, we think airbag springs are the way to go. They are a little bit more expensive, but airbags will give you a really good ride over those corrugations and rough roads, particularly if you're going for a full off-road caravan, but they also give you the ability to level up your caravan when you reach your campsite very quickly and easily. We absolutely love airbags. We've done it twice now and rate it very highly. If you don't go with airbags, you're gonna be looking at more than likely a coil spring in there, which still does a great job, don't get me wrong, but you just won't have that ability to level up when you reach camp. Now, when you're looking at really extreme off-road suspensions, you will also see suspensions such as the Cruise Master ATX suspension, which is their flagship off-road suspension, and you're going to be getting remote reservoir shock absorbers, as well as a rolling sleeve airbag, which is another upgrade again. Overkill for a lot of people. If you can afford the weight, because it is a little bit more heavy, uh, go for it. Our option with this caravan and the previous one was to go the XT, which is more their standard sort of off-road suspension range. You can still upgrade that to airbags though. Now, when it comes to brakes, you've got two main choices and that's drums or discs. Drums is gonna be standard for across the board for most caravan options and they're great in that they're extremely reliable, they work well, they're easy to service and repair. However, in this caravan, we decided to upgrade Great to disc brakes and I would not go back. They are fantastic as far as the response you get. Again, if you can afford the little bit extra, I really highly recommend disc brakes. The only downside to discs is you can't couple it with electronic stability control at this stage, although we have heard that won't be too far away, which is very exciting. All right, we've got our body, we've got the chassis, we've got the suspension, now we're gonna put wheels and tires on. There's not too much to consider here except just go for quality and go for an alloy wheel if possible, nice and light. We went with the Methods, extremely light wheel and very, very strong, just to keep that weight down. Uh, also, it looks good. I, yeah, that's got to come into it at some point. Uh, and tires, just make sure you're getting a quality tire, at least an all-terrain if you want a semi-off-road or an off-road van. Uh, make sure that no matter whether it's an on-road through to an off-road van, get a quality tire. The last thing you want to be doing is uh, having a tire failure when you're out there exploring. It can really ruin a trip. Uh, and by having quality tires, you're going to reduce the chance of that happening. Not all manufacturers will offer quality tyres from standard. The good ones do, but if they don't, see if it's an upgrade available. It's probably worth considering. You do it to your tow vehicle, you might as well do it to your caravan as well. We do get a lot of questions about should I match my wheels and tyres on my caravan to your car, to your tow vehicle. We did with our first one. We didn't worry about it with the second one. Uh, look, not a bad peace of mind, but certainly not a must have in my opinion. To put it into perspective, we haven't had a flat tyre touch wood uh, for nearly three years of full time travel. So not a big consideration in my opinion. Now you've got your construction sorted. The next big thing that we think you should take some careful time and planning and put some research into is your power system. This is gonna vary depending on how much off-grid you're gonna be wanting to do. If you're just gonna be going for a night or two at a time, not as critical as if you're gonna to wanna to do extended off-grid stays like we do. For reference, we haven't plugged in in over eight months of travel. We rarely, if ever, need to plug in at all. So that gives you an idea of what's possible if you go and get yourself a really good off-grid power system. It's more than just solar and battery. Obviously, that's got a big part of it. You need solar to get your regeneration. Otherwise, you're going to need to be running a generator or you're going to need to be driving a lot to be able to get charged into those batteries. And yes, you need a good amount of battery storage. If you want to know more about how to figure out how much power you need and how to spec your system, we've done a whole series of videos on this last year. There's two good ones there about power systems and how to figure out what you need and how to spec your system to suit what you want to do with it. I'll leave a link in the description below as well as chuck a little thing up here. The big mistake we see most people make with their power systems is that the charging system isn't capable of doing what they want it to do. 
it's easy to throw solar panels on a roof and it's easy to throw in big batteries. What we see a lot of manufacturers miss and some different brands of power systems miss is that the charging rates aren't capable of doing what people need them to be able to do. So make sure that the charging system is geared to get as much of that power generation into your batteries as possible. I'll give you a quick example to help you get your head around that. For example, in our caravan here, we've got the Enerdrive DC-DC charger that looks after all the charge from our vehicle. So it takes up to 50 amps of charge and puts it straight into our batteries. It runs completely independently, and when we're at camp, it just handles any portable solar that we plug into the van that we run externally to what's on the roof already. Our rooftop solar then runs through two Enerdrive MPPT chargers. Because we have eight solar panels on the roof, one charger wouldn't be able to handle that amount of charge, so we run it through two separate ones. That means that when we're at camp, we can get up to 80 amps of solar from the roof, and when we're driving, we can add the driving uh, charge to that and combine it so we can get up to 130 amps of charge while we're driving because we're getting all the solar and all the driving charge. I explain it more in those other videos if I've lost it in that one. Overall, in our opinion, you're better off getting a system that is all from one manufacturer. I mean, solar, batteries, charging system, the works, all from the same manufacturer as in power system manufacturer not caravan manufacturer because there's just less chance of problems occurring and if problems do occur there's less chance that there's going to be some sort of blame game between who's at fault whether it's a battery issue whether it's a charging issue or a solar issue i just think keep it all from one manufacturer and you're going to have a lot less problems and make it much easier to solve those problems when they occur and make sure whatever system you're going with that there's good support in australia available for that system so that if you do have any issues it's much much simpler to troubleshoot Alrighty, the last one for phase two of your research is water again this is going to be like power systems in that it's going to matter more the more off grid you want to go everyone that's traveled will tell you that water is going to be the number one thing that brings you back to civilization it's kind of like solar in that you can't have too much and you want to carry as much as possible but it is going to eat into your payload very very quickly so be aware of that and make sure that the manufacturer you're looking at is going to be able to include enough water storage for you to be able to go and do the type of trips that you want to be able to do Now you get into the exciting bit where you start to go and look at the caravans. Like we said, caravan shows are a great opportunity to go and do a big chunk of your research, but also they're a really good opportunity to buy, which is not something that we realised. Uh, but we've been to caravan shows for years as a punter, and more recently we've had the opportunity to be on some of the stands at the caravan shows and see a bit behind the scenes. So we've got some pretty good insight that, yeah, it's a really good opportunity to buy if you're up to that point in your research and you're... Yeah, you've narrowed down your manufacturer and you've got your final couple that you think are going to be the one for you or the final one that you think is going to be for you. All right, let me know in the comments who used to be like Simon. I would say 10 years ago, Simon took me to the first caravan show to look at a camper trailer that we might buy one day and you just wanted to look at. And we ended up looking at every single camper trailer that was there. And Simon is cagey as, like he knew that he wanted to buy one in like, say, six to 12 months. He's like not letting anyone know that I want to buy. I'm just going to look around, I'm going to suss it out, I'm going to sneak around, I'm going to open every hatch and door and I'm just looking in every single camper trailer that existed going, they all look the same. Yeah, <laughs> and I think that's a mistake. In hindsight, yeah. <laughs> if, if you're at the point where you're ready to buy or almost ready to buy, you're in the final stages of your research, um, let the salesperson know. If that's a caravan that you're genuinely interested in finding out more about, let them know your time frame, because I guess I thought I was being really clever and really savvy and keeping it all to myself, but what I ended up- Because you didn't want to be pressured into buying something. I was trying to avoid the hard sell from the salesman, which you're inevitably going to get. You just got to be prepared for that. But I, what I was trying to, yeah, what I thought I was trying to avoid led to, I just didn't get all the information and I wasn't aware of as many things as I would have been if I'd let that salesman know, I'm a genuine buyer. I'm going to be buying in the either immediately on the very near future and you will get by far a lot more attention from those salespeople, but you'll just get more information. You'd be surprised at the deals that are available at the shows. We have some of the best deals we've heard of people getting on new caravans is at the shows. So saving thousands, saving thousands. That's right. So yeah. definitely, but not just in price, but also in inclusions, they often throw things in for free, but there are a few things that when you go onto the show that we think are going to help you to not only get the best deal, but get the most out of it.
Right. Is this where you to use all your car salesman strategies from back in the no. early 2000s no. to teach them all your you strategies? You don't <laughs> need anything clever. You just need to make sure that you go in there knowing that these caravan manufacturers have spent a lot of money to be at these shows. They've got salesmen there ready to sell and they want to sell as many caravans as they can to make it worth their while. You can use that to your advantage and get yourself a really good deal. And often, like I said, you'll get a few things thrown in as well. Few things to be aware of though. Often the vans that you see at the show are specced up and made, you know, have all the accessories and everything fitted to them to make them look really good and showcase what that manufacturer is capable of. When you're coming to buying, make sure that everything you're seeing that you think is standard is actually standard, that it's not an option. What you'll often see on a van when you're looking at it, the good ones will say what the base price is and then they'll have what this spec level or what this one actually includes and it's current price. So that'll give you a good gauge of what's standard and what's not and you can go through that list from there. Yeah, absolutely. The other thing to make sure is let that salesman know, well the good ones should ask to be honest, um, let that salesman know what your financial budget is, what your weight budget is, what your time frame is and what you're intending to do with that caravan and make sure like we said earlier in the video that what they're selling you is up to scratch and it's going to be able to do what you want to do with that caravan. So I think look, the last thing with, with shows is it can be very overwhelming as well as exciting. It can be very overwhelming. There's obviously dozens of manufacturers there with hundreds of different products uh, and it can be a little bit overwhelming. So just stick to the main things at the show. If you are buying at the show, you don't have to do all your color selections and figure out all yeah, the finer save details that for later. at the show. Save that for later. Just make sure you get the, the basics laid out, the main things that you want, like the size, the layout, get that build slot booked in uh, and then you can figure out all the minor stuff like where you're going to put things and yeah and your colors and things like that later down the track we'll so talk about that later just make sure that that manufacturer can do the big no compromise items that you've identified and that they're going to meet your needs and then figure out the little stuff later okay phase three Cheers, congratulations. You've, You've come a long way. Three. You've done all your research. You've probably been to a caravan show or two and uh, talked to manufacturers. You've finalized which caravan you're going to buy. Now it gets into the exciting bit. What we call the nitty gritty or the details is phase three. So you've got worried about all the big stuff. Now we can start worrying about all the exciting stuff and all the little bits and pieces. We've got a few tips in here of things that we've missed in the past and things that we think are easy to miss, as well as a few recommendations of what you should consider uh, including in your caravan. Should we dive into it? Let's let's do it. First things first, power outlets. 240 and 12 volt power outlets. Yeah, make note of where they are and are they in a convenient spot for how you want to be using it. Um, you know, if you're going to be working from a laptop from the table, the dining table, make sure there's a PowerPoint somewhere near the dining table. Double check the out exterior as well. Uh, if you want to be taking an induction plate and a Thermomix or an air fryer outside or anything else like that, you might want to plug in that there is an external uh, 240 volt power outlet. Yep, and same goes for lighting. So lighting's the next one. Check where the lighting is. Make sure you've got enough exterior lighting for what you need. We love having spotlights, for example, on the front and rear of the van we've got now. Uh, you want to have bug-free lighting on the outside as well. Uh, interior lighting in the tunnel boot and some of your external hatches can be really handy as well. And then moving inside. Yeah, so another nice one is um, we've got these little lights and they sort of touch and they glow. Perfect if you've got little kids and they just want a little night light on in the middle of the night so yeah. they get themselves to the toilet and whatnot. You don't always want a lot of lighting. You want lighting options as well um, yep. so that you don't just have a whole lot of light all the time. Uh, but yeah, make sure you, the lighting is at where you want it and Cons where you need it. Just consider it and yep. ask for extra or less if you, to see your needs. Absolutely. Okay, another big decision you're going to probably have to make and that is heating and hot water. Uh, we've tried a couple of different options with this and the options out there, really your power source is going to either be electric, gas, diesel or a combination of those. If you're going to spend any amount of time off grid, it really needs to either be a gas or a diesel. Uh, we've had both the Truma 4E, which is a gas electric combination, as well as the Truma D6 that we've got now, which is a diesel version of that heater. Look, they're both good. Obviously, we went diesel in this this time because we went a gas-free caravan. There's no real pros or cons to either that are significant. Diesel is a bit easier to get your hands on, especially when you start going more remote, and it does have the advantage you can top it up, uh, your diesel tank that runs that. Uh, you don't have to you know, take a gas bottle that's half empty and get it refilled just in case or get it swapped over. Um, so it does have that advantage with diesel. We do like having that. And just one fuel source is really handy as well. Diesel you can also use for heating and same as gas. Uh, but what do you reckon, tank style or instantaneous? 
Oh, this is the tricky question. We've only ever had tank style and the pro of that, or the con I would say, sorry, I'll start with the con, is that it does run out and you can only have, you know, a few minutes in the shower or, um, but the pro is it also runs out and you don't burn through a heap of water. The only time I would see it being a positive would be if you're connected to a water source, like if you're staying in caravan parks frequently. Yeah. You've got access to frequent running water. Yeah, instantaneous would be handy there. <laughs> you probably, I don't think you can get diesel instantaneous. Um, and so, yeah, if you want to do off-grid, uh, really tanks the way to go. We like having our heater and our hot water in one unit, but you can separate them and do different ones if you if you want. But that's our advice on that. Okay, so the opposite to heating, cooling. cooling. <laughs> Definitely get an AC. That's we're not even going to talk any more about that. <laughs> get an air conditioner if you're going to be travelling in Australia. Yeah. But what we use more frequently than the air conditioner is actually the Sirocco fan. So make sure when you're specking your van that you've got at least two in the main living area. And if you've got kids, you want to put them in their bunks as well. They are such an efficient use of power. They cool the van right down. They are bloody amazing. But just make sure because sometimes um, manufacturers will only spec two in the main. Or one sometimes. Or one in yeah. the like main bed area and they don't have them in the kids, that's an added option that people might not realize. And a no compromise for us, it has yeah. to be done. Don't, yeah. don't consider not doing it. This is a big one that I think a lot of people will miss and that's storage for the specific items that you wanna take, particularly the, mainly the bulky items. Make sure that if you wanna take things along like we do, like your Thermomix and your coffee machine, that there's Air somewhere fries. to store it in the van because it's so easy to just forget about that when you're specking out the van, you move into the van and your stuff doesn't fit and you gotta go and put it under a bed or in a out external hatch or something like that and it's just not convenient. The way we like to consider it is things that you use frequently every single day get priority access and things that you use infrequently, we're happy to st stow them under a bed or outside in an external hatch. And same goes for your external storage. If you wanna take big things like bikes and surfboards and fishing rods or I don't know, stand up paddle boards, whatever it might be, make sure that there's somewhere in the van that that's gonna fit and then that's something that's taken into consideration at the time of build. A lot easier to sort out at the time of build than later down the track. Something else we'd recommend getting fitted up at time of manufacture is any awning accessories you might want and things like any flap kits, extra rafters and things like that. Again, way simpler to get it done at build time. Uh, I've never had an anti flap kit. I've heard they're really good. We've seen people with them and they do seem really good. It, for me, it's just more things to carry, more setup, more pack up, but it does mean you can leave your awning out in more sort of, you know, poor weather conditions, I suppose. Yeah. But yeah, if you want to get it done, get it done at manufacture. Um, just for reference, we've never used any sidewalls on our awning or anything like that. No. Nah. We personally don't use them. But again, we're off grid a lot. So if you're in caravan parks and things like that it. more, you might want that for privacy. Okay, so now we're just going to run off a quick few things straight off my list on my phone so that I don't miss anything because I'd hate to miss something. Uh, and yeah, these are just things that we'd recommend considering. Uh, these aren't necessarily all must-haves, but things that we'd consider throwing into your van as well. Right, number one is grey water bypass. This just means that the grey water doesn't go through your grey water tank all the time when it's just running straight out into a drain or onto the ground and you're only using your grey water tank when you need to. It just means that your tank doesn't get as smelly and doesn't get as uh, much crud and build up and things like that in there. Number two is rear view camera. <laughs> we missed this on the uh, Titanium. We missed that it was an option. Uh, got caught up in all the big stuff, missed the details. <laughs> Hence the throwing it into this video. Yeah, look, a rear view camera is really, really handy. Uh, and especially if you've got one that runs all the time while you're driving along the highway as well, not just when you're reversing up into a campsite. Yeah, that one was our bad. Yeah. Uh, dust suppression system. Again, if you're going to be going off-road, doing dirt roads and that, dust suppression is a really good idea. It just uh, ensures that you don't get dust in. They do work, by the way. I was a bit sceptical. They do actually work. Yeah. No one likes cleaning. Washing machine. Washing machine is a very much nice to have if you've got the payload for it. Uh, our first van didn't have one. Our, this van does. You can be more opportunistic when you, when you do your washing. If you know you're going to go and fill up your water tanks, uh, I'll often just put a load on, use what we've got, and um, saves us going into towns as frequently. But again, nice to have. You do not need one. I would prioritize other things over a washing machine for sure. Yeah, because they are a bit heavy. They're yeah. about 30 kilos. Yeah, I would take the dishwasher over the washing machine. 100%. That's what, by that's the way, what, that's what's beeping in the I, background. I is put our dishwasher. it on pause so that it wouldn't interrupt us. It wouldn't be in the background, but now it's beeping at me. Uh, next one is compost toilet. This is mainly if you want to do off-grid more than two or three days. I mean, we think they're good for everyone, but particularly if you're going to be doing off-grid, um, like we said earlier in the video, it's a no compromise for us. We love the compost toilets and yeah. 
I've never met anyone who's got a compost toilet who said they don't like it and they're going back to a cassette. No, it's always the other way around. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. All right, uh, ceramic coating. This is an interesting one. So we got a Vantex ceramic coating put on in our van not long after we bought it. And I was, I, I'd heard really good things, but I was a little bit skeptical. It just seemed a bit, yeah, like it did, wouldn't make Did you that. really need it? Yeah, did you really need it? Is it worth spending the money? Um, look, since having it, we've had it now for, well, over six months, seven, eight months or something. I love it. Ten months. Yeah, I'd, I'd definitely do it again. Um, it's, yeah, every time I wash the van, uh, in particular, I really appreciate that it's there. It's so much easier to wash the van and keep it clean. And if you're traveling full time or long term like us, finding places to wash your van isn't easy. And you're often long periods of time where you haven't given the van a wash. Uh, so the, having the coating there to protect it is definitely a uh, good peace of mind. And yeah, like I said, I'd do it again. And a lot of manufacturers will do it from factory, which is the way to go if you can. Uh, just get them to throw it on the order and then you won't think about it again and you'll just enjoy it. <laughs> Internet. Internet solution. This is another one that's a bit easy to miss. Um, don't necessarily just go with what they offer standard. Talk to them about what internet solutions they offer. Starlink integration these days is becoming a bigger and bigger need. We just did a video on that last week. If you missed that one, all about um, Starlink integration and converting it to 12 volt and stuff. Look, we, we really rate the cowfish gear. We've been using that for uh, about that same amount of time, seven, eight months now, and, and love it. Um, there's, there's probably a few other options out there. We haven't tried them out, but can yeah. recommend the cowfish. Yeah, we can only talk about what we know. Yeah, exactly. And it, it's brilliant. All right, last one is that beeping thing in the background. Dishwasher. The dishwasher. Controversial. Oh my goodness. Yeah, look, it's brilliant. It, it works it's really amazing. well. And it saves so much space in the kitchen. Yeah. Um, oh, it saves me so much time. It uses electricity to heat dishes instead of using the gas or the diesel that we would have had to otherwise. I love it. It just keeps, it's like a cupboard for the dirty dishes during the day. It keeps the kitchen clean. It keeps the kitchen organized. It uses roughly about the same. It uses, it does use a little bit more water. I'm not going to lie. It uses like six liters um, per wash compared to the, I don't know, two liters that I would use. But I'm not doing, I'm only doing that once a day instead of twice. So, you know, it is a little bit more, but worth every cent. Yep. Well, there you go. There you have it. We can't oh, imagine so living amazing. without it. It, make, it just makes sense to us. Right, guys. Well, I hope you enjoyed this one. This is the same process that we've used to find the right caravan for us and to save us some dollars along the way. Hopefully, it helps you do exactly that. We can't wait to see you guys out here on the road. Leave us a comment below. Uh, what caravan are you looking at? What are you going to buy? Uh, has this video helped you narrow down those... Uh, those options if you are out there and shopping at the moment and uh, yeah keep in touch let us know what you decide on and and how much hey yeah how much this helped you this video yeah we and also we just can't wait to see you on the road which is the best thing because get out there and see it enjoy guys cheers. cheers we'll see you next sunday see you next sunday oh don't make the eyes water that was that moustache here that was a tickle in me I think it's done one too many buttons up. <laughs> you look so it's pretty for church. It's professional, wasn't it? <laughs> oh, how do I look? Glassy eyed? Fresh as a tent. <laughs> That'll wake you up.